Thank you very much, Matt. Now, can I ask um, each of the panellists, uh, or each of the presenters, to come up and, and sit at our panel? I think we've got a, a microphone, hopefully, to, uh, to give those guys. Um, and I'll also, uh, at the same time, ask Nathan Payne to join um, our presenters. Nathan will be well known to most of you as the Executive Director of the Property Council here in South Australia. Um, the peak body representing an estimated $35 billion worth of property assets in South Australia. And um, as Nathan takes his seat, um, I might ask him to grab a, the microphone. Nicole actually mentioned your name uh, this morning when you weren't here, Nathan, um, but perhaps it, it, it's best to kick off by you um, saying a little bit about the Property Council's position in relation to EUAs. So, I mean, uh, the Property Council, and thank you, Darren, the Property Council has been uh, a long advocate for introducing EUAs in South Australia. We've seen how they've worked, perhaps how they haven't worked in Melbourne and in Sydney, um, and clearly moving into this, uh, I guess, tighter economic time and uh, with consideration to the, I guess, the Adelaide building stock, we thought the EUA model was one that could actually bridge a lot of the problems that we currently have uh, with the split incentives and uh, uh, and with, I guess, the environmental performance of the CBD. So what we did is we looked at what was happening in Melbourne, we looked at what was happening in Sydney, and we said, well, there's no reason why we shouldn't have EUAs in Adelaide. I mean, they, they're a key driver or a key tool that the industry can use to upgrade the environmental performance of, uh, of the CBD, in particular, asset stock. And that's a lovely segue, thank you for that one, Nathan, into the first question to the panel, which is essentially around the fact that South Australia doesn't have um, a, 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 an EUA mechanism at the moment, um, given the learnings and, and what you know about what you've been doing, I guess, over the, uh, the forthcoming time in, in both, um, previous time in both Victoria and New South Wales. Um, how do you think, you know, now that you've got perspective, um, what, what, what is the right way forward for South Australia? Um, thanks for that. Uh, look, I think the most positive response that I see is actually today, and that is actually the full and, and, and detailed engagement of all the stakeholders involved with this. When we started with this in 2008, 2007, it was led by the City of Melbourne, and the City of Melbourne very much went, you know, cap in hand to the state government and said, can, please, sir, can you please change our legislation? And, um, and there was problems with that, you know, we, we, the leading kind of engagement process, it was very hard to fill a room full of this and say, hey guys, we've got a good idea, what do you think? Uh, it was very much that, that kind of opportunity. I think, and I won't speak on behalf of New South Wales, but in, in New South Wales it was state government led. You know, it was uh, driven by the, the state government and engagement with uh, local governments, which was a step above what happened with uh, the city of Melbourne. And I think the, the real opportunity is right here in this room in the fact that you've got all the relevant stakeholders with a case studies to learn from and, and, and build upon out there. I think the positive engagement will help get those early runs on the board. In my engagement with, with South Australia the last year and a half, it's been a very positive sign. I'm not sure if somebody else makes sense. Yeah, just, just to add to that, I, I guess one thing from South Australia's perspective is that uh, you guys do have a, a large focus on renewable energy, so uh, lots of wind farms down here, and I think what we're uh, proposing here is, is entirely consistent with, with that approach to living and uh, that approach to government. Um, and, and then secondly, I, I think just in terms of what Adelaide can expect from the EUA, it's a new product and I guess uh, it's, it's really horses for courses, so some uh, communities may be more uh, uh, facilit facilitated towards uh, things like uh, roof rooftop solar, for example, like it's a hot day outside here today and um, I guess that's pretty indicative of an Adelaide summer. And, uh, you would think that uh, uh, solar on uh, industrial rooftops would be a great application for EUAs down here. Um, so I, I think that the product's still evolving, it's still new, um, but each council and each, uh, each state will have its own focus. 
Um, if the EUAs uh, are so good, why is it that um, the state government isn't taking control of them and administering? Why is it the local council's uh, responsibilities? Well, um, uh, well, I think the, the uh, local councils were seen as best place to deliver uh, the program. First, obviously, they have to, to, to levy and, you know, they, they manage the, the rate and that's the fundamental mechanism underpinning the, the EUA programs. And, and also, I think they, they've got that uh, vested interest, in a way, in, in getting their, you know, their building stock uh, upgraded, they know their community, they know their businesses, they've got that existing relationship with their businesses through, through their normal dealings, but also through uh, other programs. We found that uh, the city of Sydney and, and Parramatta uh, and also Newcastle, Lake Macquarie, I mean, almost all of these councils participating in the program at the moment are linking this, uh, their offering with all the programs like City Switch as well, uh, energy saver, etc. So they, they are they are close to their community. They we, we knew they were going to promote it and sell it well, and that's what we, we've seen. Uh, so there was no need for I think it was seen that there was no need for the state government to be involved more than uh, passing the legislation and facilitating the, the, the launch of of the program at the, at an early stage. I'll just add that I think part of it's also around the the way that you effectively clip the ticket, the way you collect the money. So when you, most of the council charges are pass-through charges, so you can pass it through to the tenant as part of the outgoings, whereas with state government charges, they tend not to be pass-through charges. So, I mean, the state government, I'm sure that's most, I think with one exception, which is Queensland now, where land tax can now be an outgoing for new, um, for new leases, you could notionally have a situation where the state government could do it, but otherwise you, you are beholden to having council involved. I think, I think I'd, I'd echo that as well. And when we first looked at uh, EUAs, the issue of land tax came up, uh, is can we use this mechanism? Um, at the end of the day, I think the, the, there's global precedent for using local councils. Uh, you know, state of California now has a program involving their entire economy, the seventh last, largest economy in the world, and the most amount of uh, tax um, property secured tax finance projects are now actually financed here in Australia um, uh, through these mechanisms. Uh, and from a, for I think from a, I'm not going to talk on a lender's behalf, but from a lender's perspective, I don't think there's an appetite to look at a, a different kind of mechanism to create another product that's taken five years to get to here. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was going to say one more thing from a local uh, level. Building owners, and one of the barriers to it is that they need access to, to information. Uh, and I don't know if a, a state uh, government authority would be able to provide that type of support. Um, so I, I think that does fit within council, although they, they may not be the, the perfect place. Um, I think there's definitely a lot to offer through that. And there aren't that many. Um, Opportunities and definitely from a lending point of perspective, uh, the charge has a great amount of weight, uh, which provides security. Um, Scott, I've got a question here in relation to accelerated depreciation benefits and whether they're being looked at and that sort of stuff. I know that you've done a, quite a lot of work um, around this and other issues, so would you like to? One of the early questions we had around EUAs, and, and indeed we worked with um, Low Carbon Australia and the NAB on addressing some of these, was the tax and accounting treatment associated with environmental upgrade charges. When we all first came at this, we were really hoping that they would all be off balance sheet and recognised as, a, uh, as an outgoing expense from a building owner's perspective. You know, the world has changed and accounting standards are basically presenting to put things on people's balance sheets. So uh, from a building owner's perspective, um, the assets and liabilities are the building owners and so it follows through that the tax and, uh, and accounting treatment of EUAs is similar to any other form of debt. The interesting component is actually from the tenant's perspective, you know, in Victoria and, and in New South Wales, they're not actually party to a contract. Uh, they don't own the assets. 
they're liable to pay for the use of those assets in, in, in energy outgoings. But uh, from, a, from a tenant's point of view, you know, that's where the off-balance sheet um, uh, benefits come into it. So, you know, horses for courses, projects will change and ownership structures of buildings, but in a general sense, that's the approach where we're seeing with, with the, the tax and accounting approach to it. So I'm not sure if there's an accelerated depreciation, but there is definitely a depreciation and interest cost uh, benefit in there to profit and loss uh, uh, statements. There was, there was not. Yeah, well, I won't get into that politics. <laughs> um, another uh, interesting question from the audience, um, actually directed at Ashley, but I'm, I'm sure there might be some others that want to talk to this as well. Who monitors the quality, execution and performance of the new upgrades? Is this the council responsibility? If so, are they compensated for this and other administrative hurdles associated with EUA? Uh, the council is not in charge of actually uh, monitoring the per performance, um, but there is the mechanism uh, which is created through the legislation, which says that uh, if, for example, the, the lights stop working in year two, then the charge pass through would stop in year two. So the tenants are protected that way. Um, so there's no, um, I guess, uh, ongoing monitoring by the council of the actual works, but effectively this, this is the effect of the legislation that uh, the protection's there. Okay. I think from a Melbourne perspective, we, we have a, uh, an approach to tenant consent to, to passing on that part of the charge. And from an administrative point of view, there is the, the upfront agreement that uh, indeed I assume happened with the 10 Valentine Street project is actually part of our process down here. You get that prior consent and commercial agreement between two private parties about how they will deal with that transfer and uh, ultimately that's where the, the uplift comes from. Um, our role as an administrator to the program is to ensure that the projects, uh, you know, the money is actually used for the delivery of those projects. You know, we can't come in and say, yes, it's approved for HVAC upgrade and then you get marble foyers as a result of that. Uh, that's, that's kind of the role in the development construction phase uh, of an administrator's role. Uh, and then ongoing, similar to, to what was just communicated then, uh, there is, in Victoria, there's no mandatory reporting. However, there is a voluntary reporting requirement that the City of Melbourne requires um, because they're interested in the environmental outcomes and also the value uplift within their, their community. So how about existing lenders? Um, how have they reacted to EUAs given um, their position, I guess? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. That's a question that needs to be addressed. Um, what we've found so far is that uh, a typical uh, upgrade of a, of a building from an environmental perspective represents a, a small percentage of the value of the building. So you know, a typical uh, EUA might be on um, a commercial building which is worth $60 million and the works would cost maybe two to three million dollars. So when you uh, take the, the charge component, which is paid on the quarterly basis, and you compare that to the rent of the building and the value of the building, it's, it's really quite small. So um, there's a materiality threshold there where existing lenders will say, okay, you know, sure, it might be a prior, prior charge, but um, A, uh, it's improving or leaving the cash flow of the building uh, neutral. And secondly, it's, uh, there is a lot of evidence around that uh, it will increase the valuation of the building. Uh, so our experience across the three privately funded, funded EUAs is, um, has been positive. They haven't all been NAB funded buildings. Uh, one was, uh, or two of them I think were externally funded. Um, so that gave us a, a good test case. Uh, and one of those buildings was part of a, of a portfolio which was funded by quite a few banks. And in that case, uh, it actually went through as a, um, a lot of lending agreements will have uh, uh, permitted indebtedness clauses, which uh, allow uh, building owners to basically go, go about and do their ordinary course of business. So that it allows them to lease a, lease a chiller or lease a photocopier, whatever they do, and, um, and not having the existing banks actually um, regulate and, uh, and control what they do. And uh, we find EUAs sometimes uh, fit into that basket. I think it's we SMF acted as the, uh, the other lender to those other projects as well, and, and I'd echo those sentiments. Um, we have had quite extensive discussions with existing lenders, um, both local banks and international banks that currently lend to 
uh, uh, property within uh, Melbourne. And uh, essentially, once they understand how the mechanism works and once they understand some of the risks to it, I think there is a general consensus as to the materiality of it, but also the enhanced value they get as, a, as existing secured mortgagee in the sense that uh, the value uplift that was alluded to in, in, in Ashley's slide there as by the IPD studies actually show that they get this valuation uplift while simultaneously never really being 100% exposed to the total cost of the project. So, so they're, they're, they're in an enhanced position. Okay. Um, another question, does the administration cost kill the cheapness of the finance? <laughs> no. <laughs> Easy one. Um, these mechanisms have been in place now in Melbourne for some time and in New South Wales for some time. We've only got four, four projects, I think, in total. Five projects in total. Um, is is this the, is this an expected? Is this a part of the the the? It was discussed about the communication, education, all those sorts of things as, as the uh, in the marketplace. Um, is it representative of the type of lead time that one would would expect for EUAs in the future? I mean, maybe sort of talk a little bit about how how these things will flow through. You think in the future? Um, I think when we started at this, we we thought. This is the answer to everything, and uh, build it and they will come. And uh, what we very quickly realised that this is a process of what we're doing right now. It's an engagement and education process, and this is something new. So when it's the fear of the unknown, when you talk to a building owner and say, right, well, I've got you to a position you want to do energy efficiency, which is a journey in and of itself, um, then the question comes to, well, how do you want to pay for that? You know, debt equity or an EUA. Now building owners and tenants know, yeah, get debt, I get equity, but what the hell is an EUA? So that goes straight up into the top right hand corner of a risk matrix, despite the fact that it is actually belongs in the low, lowest bottom left hand corner in the low risk scenario. So we actually spend, everybody here on the panel spends a lot of our times educating one on one within in these forums and also uh, directly with building owners, tenants and all the other stakeholders about how this mechanism works, how the, the business opportunities are embedded within EUAs can be captured and walk through it. So, I mean, that's a long-winded um, answer, but I think this we're, we're going through a process of market transformation and, and Darren, we've spoken about this previously. I think the Green Building Council went through uh, a similar kind of period at the outset and indeed it was driven by Adelaide uh, about the growth in the Green Building Council and, and Green Star. And uh, I'm hopeful that, uh, that that same enthusiasm can be attributed here in South Australia um, to EUAs that would help shorten that. To put it into context, um, the, the projects we do have signed here in Australia now, uh, in a roughly speaking, uh, are significant uh, in in the US uh, property assessed clean energy finance has been around since 2008 in residential and commercial. GFC came through. Residential has stopped, um, and now uh, commercial finance, uh, commercial pace, which is very similar to what we're doing out here, actually is now born in in uh, the seventh largest economy in the world and they have only signed one deal over there. So, and that was a, a, about a million dollar deal uh, signed about a month ago. So, so we're, we're leading the pack. The world is learning, the, as we see in the Green Deal and also in, in the US, um, where there is a common journey, but it's a market transformation we're going through. But over time, I think these contracts will become better understood, simpler, and uh, become more of a, a transactional process. And, and just to, from low carbon's perspective, um, part of our remit obviously is to focus on reduction of carbon footprint uh, associated with uh, the building owners and, and I think in the uh, early phase of our, um, our contribution to the, the product, that was probably more so our focus with the, uh, the parties that we spoke to and the, the mid-tier sort of building owners, they're not as interested in that as they are with the business case and that's where the, the focus has now turned to more so, is focusing on that business case which the EUA as a funding product has a, a very positive story to tell and 
in, in that um, process, we've now sort of uh, engaged more with those parties and that is starting to reduce these timeframes and lead times associated with the projects as well. I was just going to add, um, dealing with uh, some of the, the portfolio groups like CBRE and JLL and Savills and so forth, the level of detail which they are sort of working uh, towards getting so they can provide uh, advice to their building owners which is credible and accurate in, in relation to their asset um, has been required to get more and more and I think with these examples with the figures uh, that are coming out with the business case, I think that'll become uh, very useful to, to building owners. Um, in making their decisions, so that will speed up. Uh, another one of our questions. Is there interest in any sustainability projects beyond energy and water? Uh, their benefits uh, in considering a broader scope, and I guess that gets into questions in relation to innovation technologies and risk, and so that might be a, a, a topic each of you might, might want to address at some just from a banking perspective, um, we are primarily focused on proven technologies, so making sure that, and this is more from a, a reputational uh, perspective, uh, making sure that the works that are anticipated to happen, happen, and that the savings that are anticipated to happen, happen. And uh, really proven technologies uh, like what has been funded historically under EUAs uh, are, are typical and should, there should be a market uh, f for those types of technologies for a long time to come. Um, you know, in terms of emerging, emerging technologies, a bit tougher and uh, uh, certainly we would need to uh, adjust our, um, our risk, risk, risk frame to, to look at those. I think from our, from our point of view, absolutely. Um, we're having some discussions around potential waste uh, projects and you know, physical alterations to a property to accommodate different waste services, so long as it basic, basically adheres to the principle of the, that any improvement is permanently affixed to a building and delivers an environmental outcome, then that's the general rule of thumb. From an, an administrator's point of view, we've set up a um, a couple of assessment pathways that enable clear decision making frameworks to, to, to be communicated to the market to, to lower the risk of application. It's not like a, a green building fund where it, he who fills out the application best wins. This is if you do steps one through six or one through five or however many it is, you're going to get funded you know, somewhere, somehow, subject to credit. Um, and uh, those kind of opportunities come through. So we do encourage uh, innovation through a common improvements channel and we recognise that, that, that some of these assets will need to be repositioned. Um, and so we do encourage innovation, but we do recognise a long flat tail of technology that's out there that has a proven track record of delivering these outcomes. So we've simplified our application process to, as down to what's in, um, and then if it's very clear that you want to go down a, a green building or an innovative pathway, we say yes, you can part, partly fund those projects, but we'll put up an external review process, then they'll provide those innovation recommendations and technology review back to us. But I'm assuming it would be limited to um, those sorts of upgrades you can do that will deliver a saving to the tenant. Well, this, this is a, is the, there's absolutely no reason in Victoria a tenant um, could not agree to pay more than what they're currently paying because it's a tenant consent. This is a commercial negotiation between building owner and tenant. It's not this test of you know worse off. From a tenant's perspective, and I'm just being hypothetical here, you know, you may agree to pay more through an EUA because you're getting greater amenity out of your building. Um, and from a tenant's perspective, paying for that through an EUA is a hell of a lot more attractive than paying it through a rent review. So um, this notion of no worse off is you know, it's subject to commercial agreement between building owner and tenant in, in the way we take it down here. And, um, and, and tenants have to agree to a charge that would be passed through on, onto that. The, the test comes back to, is it in the municipality? Do they pay rates? Are they current on their rates? Um, underwriting criteria, standard financing underwriting criteria, and is it permanently affixed to the building? And will it deliver and it deliver an environmental outcome? And if, I can, if I can add, in uh, New South Wales, the legislation allows a wide range of works to be uh, funded for an EUA. 
uh, some of this work will not result in uh, reduction in energy bills. Uh, we, we always use the example of bicycle racks, for example, could be funded for an EA. The issue might be to find a lender uh, willing to, uh, to, to, to fund that for an EA. But uh, our legislation allows really a wide range of, uh, of works to be, uh, to be funded. Uh, the um, pass through to the tenants, obviously, if there is no uh, savings for the tenant, uh, can only happen if the tenants uh, agree. So if, uh, for example, a large corporate tenant is very keen on having bicycle racks in installed in their, in their building, they will not see any uh, reduction in their utility bills. Or, however, if they are ready to uh, contribute, they, can, they, 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 they will be uh, able to enter into an agreement with their landlord and contribute to that particular work. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, just to clar clarify, fr from our perspective, um, we, we would certainly um, be very interested in funding bike racks. Um, but, but so, so yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but for example, if there was um, a building owner who wanted to put a uh, you know, million dollar uh, solar fuel, fuel cell and bike racks, and bike racks uh, <laughs> um, we might have a few issues. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, on that note, um, we've run out of time. But um, I'd like you to um, join with me in thanking each of the presentations and the panellists today for their efforts. <laughs>